looking at the studies in each kid. What we found was that the vast majority of the studies were only there for one real reason, which was they were so different bits of the business could tell other bits of the business they were doing a really bad job. Um, and th there's a lot of market research that you can actually get rid of for a variety of reasons, which I'm going to go through now, because to me, if you do have minimal budget, the trick is not to try and have a whole lot of small projects, it's actually to try and do a small number of things really well. A lot of studies get over-engineered. Um, a particular type of research, which I now don't do anymore, is packaging research, because it's a, you can easily spend $50,000 trying to work out whether the gold or the black pack is better, but no one's really going to ever make any money out of that important decision, I'll argue. And there's the studies where you know the answer. Now, I, for whatever reason, I was sure the first time around that he was innocent. I can't tell you why, I had no real insight into it. But this second time, when he was accused of robbing hotel rooms with a gun to get back OJ memorabilia, I was pretty sure he was guilty. Again, no real evidence, but there's a lot of studies which potentially you know the answer to. Does anybody here drink this? Yeah? Okay. 15 years ago was the first time I got asked the question of what is it with South Australia and iced coffee? Now, whatever it is, it's been going for a long time. And if, and I, I did get asked the question again about two weeks ago. And if it's still an issue, it was, whatever the reason was, it was the same reason it was 15 years ago. Um, by all means, pay us to ask for it again. Um, but if we didn't get it right 15 years ago, markets don't tend to change very rapidly. And this is one of the points that Peter was talking about before. When you conclude that most brands don't change share, the reason they don't change share is the needs that they're tapping into aren't changing. And if the needs they're not tapping into aren't changing, you don't need to focus too much on monitoring those changes. The silver bullet study. These are studies when a company's got no idea what to do and they think the market researchers will help. And I'm a quantoff. My speciality is doing unnecessarily complicated projects. Um, and people believe that if they've got a really bad problem with their business, the person who does really complicated maths is going to be the best one to come up with the answer. Well, never. I've actually never been successful. If um, anybody has, tell me and I'll forward on these briefs when they come through. Um, if you don't know what your problem as a business is, researchers generally struggle to help you because while you can be very grandiose about market research, at the end of the day, its job is measurement. And a company that's in enormous trouble and doesn't know what to do, doesn't even know what to measure. And so the market researcher tends to not add as much value as we'd like. And the last one, to really depress some people, studies with a goal of finding insight tend not to work. When research is done well, we find insight. Might be the research who finds it, might be the client who's done it. But when you actually set out with the goal of finding insight, at best, you come up with a really compelling story which kind of sounds almost plausible when you deliver it, but the next day people are feeling sad because they told you too little. Um, so if you've got a small amount of money, I'd suggest there's a, a very basic test of whether you're ready to even do research productively. You need to be able to list the exact decisions you want to make or you need to list the behaviours you want to change. So if your idea for research is we want to understand what it is about South Australia and iced coffee, please explain. Happy to do the research, but nothing will be learned, I'd suggest. If instead you've got a specific product that you're looking to launch, that's something that can be researched. Or if you can identify the behaviour that you want changed, that is you want truck drivers to stop drinking iced coffee and move on to Coca-Cola, again, that's tangible enough to be operational, or tangible enough to be addressed. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the second great way of saving money, and this is something I'm quite passionate about, is moving off research-based measures to what we call operational metrics of performance. A wonderful management consultancy company, and I say they're wonderful because they're a client, um, called Bain, wrote a book about two, 20 years ago now, and it's just got a follow-up book, and they've told pretty much every major service organisation in the world that you actually only need to ask one market research question, and that's the question I get. And if you can ask this question, you can compute something called a net promoter score, where you work out how many people said they'd recommend you, how many people indicate they definitely wouldn't recommend you, and the difference between that is your net promoter score. Now, if you're trying to cut money and you can get everything down to a single question, you're going to save a bomb. Problem is, you do it and someone goes, yeah, you need to rest with South Australia and that costs you a bit more money. Somebody else tells you, I need a national study. Don't be provincial, it's got to talk to everybody. Somebody else says, yeah, we need to get by product, by brand, and by call centre. 
or in the case of Bain, they'll tell you that you need to have 60% of your customers ask this one really important question. And somebody else goes, well, there's no point knowing how everybody was doing on the 27th of August 2009. We need to be tracking it over time. And all of a sudden, our one single question has become a very, very expensive bit of research, particularly because it's actually not such an informative question. And even Bain, after asking this, will go, well, why? Because it turns out that just knowing that somebody says they're likely to recommend you doesn't give you that many ideas. Now, the solution to the problem in this situation, this is a, I, th I would say, very much a service organisation type solution, is you need to be working out how the market research metrics, be they satisfaction, likelihood of recommendation, perceived value, how they relate to the internal metrics. And you do that in a very basic way, which is you get a sample of your customers, you conduct a survey with them, and then you link up the survey results to your internal records, which are taking great care not to violate any privacy issues. Um, and you can do it, you know, there's much debate range on this issue. Every large service organisation does do it. Um, and then what you do is uh, take the situation where you might be dealing with call centres dealing with particular branches of banks. Um, we can measure, we might want to match up our net promoter score with how satisfied, not how satisfied, how many calls customers are making. We might find that amongst customers who don't have to call a call centre about a particular branch, the net promoter score is pretty high, they've got no trouble. People who have to make one call to the branch or that to a call centre in a year, they'll have a lower net promoter score. People who've got two, well, things aren't going so well, they'll have a much lower net promoter score. People who've got three or more calls, clearly the problems aren't getting resolved, they'll have a much lower net promoter score. Again, now, that you get a relationship like that, it's pretty obvious, it's not so insightful, but the key thing about it is, once you have that, you can use it to work out research results, if you like, or your net promoter score for a whole lot of branches and banks and whatever type of things you're measuring that you haven't talked to. So looking here, consider we've got two call centres. The first one is in a situation where of the customers who are assigned to that call centre, 90% never call. Well, we know that people who don't have to make a call have got a net promoter score of 30 because we learned that from the market research. So 90% of 30 is 27. We've got 10% who have to call once. We know they've got the net promoter score of four, so 10% of four is 0.4, and we add them up, we get a net promoter score for the call centre of 27.4. Um, doing the same maths for call centre two, you work out that they've got a lot more people making a lot more calls, and we know that translates to a lower net promoter score, which gives us an estimated NPS of 17.9. Now, the key thing about doing a computation like this is the market research gives us the underlying framework linking how the customer feels and how the customer acts to our internal metrics. But once we've understood that relationship, we can just use it, the internal metrics to understand how performance is going over time. And so obviously it becomes very easy to do week by week estimates of our performance, to do branch by branch estimates of our performance without having to do an impossible number of interviews. The same basic idea can be applied to segmentation and pretty much is by all large, no, that's not true actually, increasingly is being applied by most large service organisations um, and also by some product organisations who have got, who are able to buy online data. The idea is that you do your market research in a fairly, you can be doing it in a traditional way or you can do it in a much more modern way to understand what the needs of the market has. But then you map these onto your internal data, which can be customer records, it can be transaction data, it can be usage data. So, for example, if you think of something like a mobile broadband card or a US mobile USB card, which increasingly people are using to connect to the internet, you might do a market research study which tells you there's two core needs being addressed. One is 